Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today, we're discussing three more cold cases suggested by the community. Let's get into it. Number one, Timothy Dees. Timothy Dees, a 26-year-old man, went missing from Madison County on February 27th of this year and has not been found. Timothy resided in Crev Kerr, Missouri. Timothy had worked for six years at the St. Louis Local 6 as a stage rigger. He worked at different arenas in the St. Louis area. His family said that Timothy loved setting up concerts and working with the stage lighting. Timothy was last seen by his mother, Barbara Hall, on Friday, February 25th, when he left her home in Jefferson County. He was going to Fredericktown in Madison County with Caleb Nanny, a childhood friend, and they intended to spend the weekend together. When Timothy didn't call her over the weekend, Barbara began to worry. He always called or texted to let his mother know he was okay. It was a habit for him to text his mom and call her frequently after his brother died. He knew his mother would be worried about him. After Barbara did not hear from her son all weekend, she tried to call his phone. Timothy had not set up his voicemail, so she could not leave a message. This was normal for Timothy, so no surprise there. But when she tried texting his phone, the text didn't go through and she knew something was wrong. Around 1 a.m. in the early morning hours on Monday, February 28th, Timothy was last seen on surveillance in a local gas station in Fredericktown. He withdrew $160 and proceeded to play the slot machines. He looked alive and well, and not in distress, according to the sheriff's department. Three hours later, around 4.40 a.m., a 911 call comes into the Madison County Dispatch Center. According to the dispatch, the 911 quarter was down in December of the previous year, and a new one was not installed until the middle of March the next year. After the call, Barbara said that deputies responded to a house on Village Creek Road in Madison County where the 911 call originated from. There, they proceeded to arrest the friend that Timothy had been traveling with on warrants. Barbara goes on to state that the deputies never questioned the residents about Timothy's whereabouts, even though they knew he was reported missing. According to Barbara, Madison County Sheriff's Department has been no help. Kathy McCutcheon, the sheriff, says that her department has addressed every lead. She states that she's been working with the Missouri Highway State Patrol and assisted them in the investigation. A few days after Timothy's disappearance, Barbara received a call from Caleb, the friend that Timothy left to go to Fredericktown with for the weekend, via a video conference call from jail. Unprompted, Caleb proceeds to tell Barbara that he would never hurt Timothy and that he would do everything he could to find him. Barbara said that Caleb had not been any help because his story kept changing every time she spoke with him. Barbara is still adamant that the Madison County Sheriff's Department has done nothing to help with the investigation. Barbara travels to Madison County daily to distribute flyers and speak with residents. There are a lot of unanswered questions about Timothy's disappearance that Barbara would like answered. One of the questions is why deputies did not inquire about Timothy's whereabouts when they were dispatched to the residents after the 911 call was made. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Number 2. Daniel Morgan On March 10, 1987, Daniel Morgan, a Welsh private investigator in London, went for a drink with his business partner, Jonathan Rees, at the Golden Lion Pub in Sydenham. Daniel, 37, and Rees sat at the pub and had a single drink each. They departed shortly after, going their separate ways around 9 p.m. Forty minutes later, a man found Daniel in the parking lot of the pub on the ground. Daniel was declared deceased at the scene, with the murder weapon, a hatchet, still embedded in his head. It was a gruesome murder and one that had shocked locals in the area. Daniel Morgan's family had also immediately been concerned about the coming investigation. Daniel's brother knew that he'd been working on a case regarding police corruption, and it had been an immediate concern that someone within the local police force had caught wind. No one had come forward as a witness, despite several pleas from the media. The hatchet had been a common, general store make and model without any unique identifiers, but the killer had placed two bandages around the handle to act as grip. Initially, the case was assigned to Sid Fillery, a detective sergeant at the Catford Police Station, and he had handled the collection of the crime scene evidence, the initial witness statements, and documenting the process. Months later, it was revealed that Fillery had been working with Jonathan Rees. Fillery had been the one to interrogate Rees, but hadn't disclosed that the two were friends. 
after which Villery Rees and two other police officers, along with Rees' brother-in-laws, were arrested but later released. Villery was removed from the case, but he resigned from the police department altogether and joined Rees in replacing Daniel Morgan in the private investigation business. There had been several allegations that Daniel and Jonathan were having several differences of opinion regarding the business. Rees was very well connected with the police department, whereas Daniel kept his distance. Daniel didn't trust the police department, concerned about corruptions within the ranks. One witness stated that Rees had conspired to have Daniel murdered to get him out of the business, even revealing that Sid Fillery had been brought in to replace Daniel once he was taken care of. Rees and Fillery denied this conversation took place, but it is what happened after Daniel's murder. The statements were deemed as not corroborated as there had been no additional witnesses and the witness who made the statement was under investigation for fraud and therefore deemed not reputable. Months later, a former employer came forward saying that Daniel had approached him about asking for help selling a story to the newspaper about police corruption, solidifying the belief that Daniel was killed because of the article he was working on. In 1989, Jonathan Rees was arrested a second time for the murder of Daniel Morgan, and this time he was charged, however the charges were eventually dropped. Meanwhile, the Morgan family were continuing to keep the case in the media and keep pressuring lawmakers and detectives and papers to keep the case alive. Detectives decided to set up surveillance within the office of Rees and Fillery. They discovered that the two were working closely with tabloid newspapers, and their clientele became less than honest. The two were hired by a man to plant drugs on his ex-wife before a custody hearing, so his ex-wife would be deemed an unfit parent by the courts and he wouldn't have to pay child support. It hadn't been the evidence they were looking for, but law enforcement had to intervene and blow the undercover surveillance operation. Rees was arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit a crime and sentenced to seven years in prison. Over the passing decades, the case remains unsolved. Reese is now out of prison, but is still a suspect to have been involved with Daniel Morgan's murder. The Metropolitan Police have been under incredible scrutiny since this case. Several audits have revealed deep and systematic corruption within law enforcement that really hasn't been addressed. Reese had deep connections and had help from officers. Villery had been a detective for many years and, in addition to knowing police protocols, was also well-connected. The undercover surveillance had revealed one instance where they'd been willing to commit a crime in order to make a buck. And that surveillance had happened years after Rees and Fillery had gone into business together. It wouldn't be a stretch to conclude that they might have done this before. In that case, two officers had also been arrested in connection with the crime for planting the drugs on an innocent woman. Those aren't the kind of officers you want investigating the man who was murdered for trying to bring to light corrupt officers. In 2021, Morgan's brother Alistair is still raising awareness and meeting with law enforcement to try and get action taken. In a recent report expressing concerns about the corruption within the Metropolitan Police, they said, a culture still exists that inhibits both organizational and individual accountability. The family of Daniel Morgan suffered grievously as a consequence of the failure to bring his family justice. The unwarranted assurances which were given, the misinformation which was put into the public domain, and the denial of failings on the investigation, including failing to acknowledge professional competence, individuals' venal behavior, and managerial and organizational failures. The Metropolitan Police have also repeatedly failed to take a fresh, thorough, and critical look at past failings, concealing or denying failings for the sake of the organization's public image. Is dishonesty on the part of the organization for reputational benefit and constitutes a form of institutional corruption? It happened in 1987. The body of Daniel Morgan, a father of two young children, was found one night in March in a South London car park. Daniel Morgan's brother Alistair believes he was executed. An axe was embedded in his head. Some still maintain the private detective was poised to sell a story about drug-related police corruption. For nearly 30 hours, they did hold for questioning Daniel Morgan's partner, John Rees, and two of Rees's relations. 
His former business partner, Jonathan Rees, who mixed in police circles, would twice be charged in connection with the murder. And this is the car park. Jonathan Rees has always maintained his innocence. He and others connected to the case spoke about the murder in a Channel 4 documentary last year. There was no evidence ever of us being involved in the murder of Daniel Morgan. What's difficult about that? Today, the panel said it couldn't conclude that there was police involvement in the murder, but the subsequent investigation suffered from deliberate police corruption from the outset. Number three, Shane McLaughlin. Shane McLaughlin was just 15 years old when he first went missing from his mother's home in Romulus, Michigan, in Metro Detroit. He was eventually found and returned, but then decided to move in with a relative to attend high school. He was last seen leaving his residence at 1048 on the evening of October 28, 2020. He was captured on camera getting into a dark colored SUV, possibly a Dodge Jeep or Durango, and had a Nike duffel bag with him. Shane has a heartbeat tattoo on the side of his left arm and both ears pierced. On October 18, 2021, Crime Stoppers and the team's family marked the first anniversary since anyone had seen or heard from the teen. Crime Stoppers of Michigan was offering a $2,500 reward for any information. Shane's mother, Nicole Quarles, is seen on TV tearfully asking for just a phone call from her son to let her know that he is safe. Not to return home, but just to call. Shane then surfaced in a TikTok video. The video showed Shane with his missing poster in the background and a medical mask on, alleging he left home because he was physically and emotionally abused. In the TikTok video, he claimed that he'd suffered from mental issues since he was 14, and when he asked for help from his mother, she would tell him to get over it. The TikTok videos have since been removed. According to Shane, he alerted police and child services about the abuse, and he alleged that no one would help him, so he chose to leave on his own. Saying in the video, I'm doing great on my own. I'm doing fine. I don't need nobody. You guys might think because I'm young, I need someone to rely on, but I don't. I'm perfectly capable of living by myself. There's no one that I need in life. I just want to be alone. Quarles then acknowledged in her own TikTok video that this is indeed her son, but denied the abuse claims. She stated that Shane had been counseling for anxiety, but was experiencing difficulties at home. She said that she believes he has been brainwashed, and she fears for his life and will not stop looking for him. Quarles said that she and the police know the woman that is helping Shane. She lives near Quarles, and Quarles had taken out a personal protective order against the woman. Quarles said that despite the court order, the older woman had not kept her distance from her so that court action would take place. She stated that if Shane agrees to meet with the police so that they can determine his well-being, she will call off the search. She has stated that she believes that Shane was groomed by the older woman and that the two have been in some sort of relationship. According to the Romulus police, Shane is still considered a voluntary missing person. Law enforcement have stated that there isn't any evidence to prove Shane was abused, nor his siblings. However, they have stated that once Shane turns 18, he will not be required to return to his family, but they would like him to reach out so that they can make sure he's okay. As of right now, the case remains open. This case is kind of unique, but because Shane is still a minor, and given his age and the allegations made on both sides, it is paramount that law enforcement know he is okay, and that there wasn't anything criminal with his disappearance. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Romulus Police Department. Shane McLaughlin has been missing since Sunday, October the 18th of 2020. He was last seen at 10.48 p.m. on surveillance video getting into a dark colored SUV, possibly a Dodge Journey or Jeep in the city of Romulus. The SUV drove off and Shane has not been seen or heard from since by his family or friends. He was 15 years old when he went missing. I want to let you know, Shane, if you're watching this, nobody's mad at you. Your mom's not mad at you. And we just want you home safe. And even if you don't want to come home, just call somebody just so we know you're all right and safe. Shane, if you're out there and you're watching, 
We love you and we miss you. We want you to come home. And if you don't want to come home, at least call somebody and let us know that you're okay. We don't know if you're alive. We don't know if you're safe. We don't know anything and we want to know. We love and we miss you so much. Please call or come home if you can. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like the content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. If you could also give this video a like if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated as that helps the channel to grow. We also have channel membership and Patreon so you can get more behind the scenes as well as exclusive content or to just support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find links to all my socials to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you on the next one. Bye for now.